Throughout my life, I've played my fair share of video games. I've played Call of Duty, a little bit of Fallout, Grand Theft Auto, Counter Strike, Sims, and fucking Roblox. And, uh. But if there's one game in particular that has caught my attention for so damn long, it's the Half Life series. To be exact, I'm talking about 2004's Half Life 2. Now listen. I know 2004 also had Call of Duty, GTA, and The Sims, but I'm sorry to say this, but Half-Life 2 takes the cake. As you may have guessed, who the title of this very video you're watching, this is gonna be a bit of a retrospective on the game. So without any more talking, let's dive into this certified hood classic of a game from 2004. Also, this will have spoilers for the game, obviously, and also this video kind of acts as like my channel's voice reveal. Let's start with the story. Now, I'm gonna try to explain the story in an incredibly simple manner, so I might miss a couple thing or two, but I mean, come on, tell me some slacker. Our story begins in the year of 2023. Yes, believe it or not, Half-Life 2 does take place around 2023. Since it takes place 20 years after the first game, which was set in like the year 2000 or something. Around that period, Gordon Freeman, middle name not available by the way, no one knows what his middle name is, is awakened by the G-Man from Stasis, and is put smack down in the center of City 17. To be exact, the City 17 train station, which fun fact is actually based on the real life Budapest train station. And so um, yeah guys, uh, Budapest along with the entire country of Hungary is technically speaking City 17. <laughs> Even though canonically it's actually Bulgaria, as confirmed by the Cyrillic slash, you know, Slavic letters in the game, and also confirmed by Viktor Antonov, the game's lead artist, um, who happens to be Bulgarian, by the way. After Gordon gets off the train, he encounters his former administrator, Dr. Wallace motherfucking Green. Middle name also not available, by the way. His former administrator in Black Mesa. At this point, Gordon does not know what the hell is going on. I mean, bro basically time traveled like 20 years in the future, so that makes a whole lot of sense if you think about it. After that, Gordon meets a couple of citizens, and probably one of the most important ones is that one woman whose husband got taken by the Combine, or to be exact, Overwatch, technically. Young girls drugged by green sparkling water, she obviously barely remembers shit. Are you the Welcome only ones on that City train? 17. You have chosen, or been chosen, to relocate to one of seven. Overwatch stopped our train in the woods and so took my husband for questioning. They said he'd be on the next train. My administration I'm not here. sure when that was. The Did their, their being nice, though, letting me wait for him. I've been proud to fall. After that, he moves on and is almost transferred to Nova Prospect, which will play an important role later on. Thankfully, good old Barney Calhoun, his old ugly ass looking low poly friend from Black Mesa, saves him. After that, Gordon is reunited with Dr. Isaac Kleiner, one of his friends and colleagues from Black Mesa. After that, Gordon attempts to make his way to Kleiner's hidden secret lab, which will definitely stay hidden for like another four weeks or so. Trust me on that one. On the way, he sees signs of the Combine's oppression of humanity, which, um, I don't know about you, but this reminds me of two interesting countries which have, a uh, similar authoritarian regimes. Unfortunately for Freeman, because he basically does not know shit about the City 17, he ends up being nearly captured by the Combine's funny gas mask wearing people, also known as Civil Protection or CP for short. Thankfully Gordon's ass gets saved by Alex Vance, who judging by her last name is the daughter of Eli Vance, makes sense, who's once again one of Gordon's old friends and also the leader of the resistance movement against the Combine. Oh, and also Calhoun and Alex are also resistance leaders, along with maybe Isaac Kleiner. With her help, he reaches Isaac's lab, which just so happens to be on the floor beneath him. Yeah, I know. Yeah, all he needed was not to have the Combine on his tail and to also use the damn elevator in the other room. Wow, good job, Freeman. And then finally Gordon meets Isaac and his little pet alien headcrab Lamar, who no offense or anything, is the most useless Half-Life 2 character of all time, and later re-meets Calhoun. Ironically enough, the day that Gordon arrived on was the same day Kleiner was ready to test out his new teleportation device thingy, uh, aka Red Letter Day by the way. 
which takes you from point A, Isaac's lab, to point B, Eli's lab. And it just so happens that Eli wants Gordon to work at his lab over at Black Mesa East. Yeah, I know what a clever goddamn name, Eli. You know, you're, you're, you're a goddamn former scientist from Black Mesa and I named your goddamn little secret laboratory Black Mesa East. Isaac decides to teleport Alex and Gordon to Black Mesa East. However, unfortunately, in the words of our great Alpha Sigma British Romanian sex trafficker, sparkling water drinking, 20 cups a day of coffee drinker, 3 kilos of meat eating and kickboxing fanatic, Andrew Rotato, We live in a world where women are respected and are taken to Black Mesa East easily. But men, or in this case, Gordon Freeman, have to deal with the malfunctions and trouble, which is why I think all women need to remain in the kitchen. I mean, good traditionalist, submissive wives who make me sandwiches every day. By the way, shout out Elon Musk for letting me on Twitter again. Or X. Gordon, thanks to Lamar being an asshole, ends up not teleporting to Black Mesa East, and even for a split second teleports to Breen's office. As a result, Gordon is forced to continue on foot, and with his old crowbar, which Barney happened to save, gets on his path. He goes through the canals of City 17, which are probably filled with a whole lot of piss and shit, and Jesus Christ, they're probably filled with like other inky dinky stinky things, man. And he encounters a goddamn chopper. Yeah, Gordon is such a threat to the combine that they send a goddamn chopper to get him. After that, Gordon manages to get through the canals and acquires more weapons as he progresses through, like the pistol and the ever so amazing the SMG. Unfortunately, the Combine resorts to having to bomb the canal with canisters filled with head crabs, which actually works and disrupts the resistance path, but does not affect Freeman. Freeman escapes using the airborne and makes his way to Eli. For this journey, he encounters a lot of Combine and former resistance bases. And midway through his journey, he gets his hands on a pulse cannon for his airboat, which fun fact uses the same sound effects as his tool gun from Gary's mod. Yeah, I, I know, you, you definitely didn't need to know that. Uh, I, don't, I don't even know why I mentioned that, to be honest. After probably like three in-game hours, he gets to the dam that's right in front of Black Mesa East. But unfortunately for our little poor cutie patootie, he needs to fight another ah! chopper. Jesus Christ, cut the man some slack. And more CPs. And finally, he reaches Black Mesa East. Gordon reunites with Eli and Judith Mossman, who, fun fact, was originally supposed to have Gordon's physician, but thanks to Gordon having experience from the University of Innsbruck in Austria on teleportation, he got the position. He also reunites with Alex, who shows them around the place, but more importantly, she gives Gordon one of the best weapons in all of video game history. The motherfucking gravity gun. Or if you're a nerd, the zero point energy field manipulator. Not gonna lie, that's a whole lot of words to be honest. Gordon learns how to use it, and also gets to meet Alex's so-called pet dog named Dog. <laughs> I actually, I actually tricked you, he's not a dog, he's actually a robot. Gordon gets to play fetch with him, but the Combine didn't want Gordon having fun, and they sent like 3% of their goddamn army over to get him. This includes CPs, choppers, scanners, you name it, my man. Gordon and Alex and Doc try to make their way back to Eli and Judith, but unfortunately they end up having to separate. After that, Dog is instructed by Alex to take Gordon over to Ravenholm. Which fun fact used to be a mining town inhabited by human rebels, but it was shelled to oblivion and turned into a place straight out of hell. Like literally, Ravenholm feels like a level out of doom or something. Gordon however thankfully finds a monk, by the name of Father Gregory, a monk who was one of the rebels in Ravenholm. But after the combine shelling, he went dark shit insane. With his help, Gordon gets the hell out of Ravenholm for the church's cemetery. But prior to that, Gordon encounters new types of headcrabs and headcrab zombies, which were all genetically modified by the Combine to have traits like speed and poison. After all that shit, Gordon makes it through Ravenholm, through the Ravenholm mines, and gets back to the surface. Here, Freeman encounters Combine snipers, which by the way, have the worst defense ever. Like you can easily throw a grenade at their ass and they'll just die. But they're pretty damn OP though. But when it comes to weaponry, they're pretty goddamn OP, like the sniper rifle can kill you in like one or two shots. He also encounters Combine Soldiers and Combine Shotgun Soldiers, or Shotgunners for short. Or basically like the CPs, except they don't have any sort of consciousness. They're basically just brainwashed and biologically engineered to kill anything that comes in front of them. But they're way too shitty for our man, Free Man. Gordon gets to a coastal resistance base, where he gets in contact with Alex for a very shitty looking transmission Bruh. TV monitor thing. Gordon learns from Alex that Eli was actually taken by Judith Mossman to Nova Prospect. Yes, the same Nova Prospect that Freeman was meant to be taken to. And this is all thanks to goddamn Judith. Honestly, when I first played this game, I knew something was up with that woman. Gordon sets out to rescue Eli. In the process, he meets other resistance leaders like Odessa Kubich. 
who has to have like the most British accent I have ever heard in my life. Like Jesus Christ, Val, you didn't need to make him that stereotypical, god damn. And Gordon makes his way for the coast, and with his trusty, rusty, and dusty scout car. Which correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's meant to be like a stripped down Mercedes Benz from like the 1930s or 20s. Like, the, like that thing has to be like nearly 100 years old by the game's time. But I mean, hey, maybe they did like a couple of modifications on it. Which fun fact, one of those modifications, which is like very visible by the way from the start, uh, includes a Tau Cannon. Gordon makes it to the Antlion Camp, a resistance camp that is ironically enough very close to Nova Prospect. In there, he gets a hold of the bug bait, a little squishy ball that turns ant lines or bugs from enemies to allies in seconds. With this weapon, Gordon easily raids Nova Prospect. After fighting through hordes of combine soldiers and ant lion guardians, which is like the ant lion's older brother that can't be tamed by the bug bait, but then finally, Gordon reaches the depot of Nova Prospect, the place where high level enemies of the combine are detained. One of them includes Eli. After reuniting with Alexandria Lance Vance from Vice City, he finds out where Eli, and more importantly, Judith are. After a bit more fighting, he finally gets to Eli, and he, Alex, and Judith, and Eli are all planning on going to Kleiner's. But unfortunately, what? Judith disagrees and fucking teleports herself and Eli to Breen's office in the Citadel. She literally betrayed them, like, like why would you do that? Jesus Christ, stupid woman. Gore and Alex decide to teleport to Kleiner's lab to get the hell out of Nova Prospect. But unfortunately, after they teleport to Kleiner's lab, the teleporter and the whole room and the whole prison explode and are turned to smithereens. Alex and Gordon learn from Kleiner that it actually took them like a week to teleport because of how slow the teleporter was, and they find out that the explosion they caused started a whole damn uprising in the city. Ah yes, baby, just like what happened in Syria and Libya in 2011. Gordon and Alex decide to contribute as much as they can to the uprising, with Gordon leading on his soldiers, and Alex helping Kleiner move out of the lab. And later, she helps Gordon. Unfortunately, the door is separated again, after the Combine captured Alex on top of a goddamn roof while she was scouting for a path. Gordon decides to continue on his own, and this time he continues through once again the canals of City 17. After going through the canals and fighting a bunch of Combine elites, he finds a bunch of rebels who are stuck because of snipers, and then he deals with them. And then he finds Barney with the same problem and helps them out. After that, Gordon and Barney go over to the Combine Nexus, which is basically like a museum that was like converted for like a base for Overwatch or something, I don't, I don't really know. After successfully taking down the Nexus, Gordon moves on over to the Citadel and fights a bunch of Striders, gunships, and like, and like what, like us 1,000 soldiers? I mean, Jesus Christ, he's an absolute unit, let me just tell you that. And finally, he makes it into the Citadel to fulfill not only the goal of the Resistance, but also Barney's goal. See Dr. Breen. Tell him I say. Gordon goes through like five floors of the Citadel and gets his gravity gun supercharged, which kills enemies by picking them up. And finally, he makes it to Breen's office. At Breen's office, Breen, who has Gordon in his own hands and has captured him, offers him to join him. But obviously, Gordon being the absolute unit he is, declines. Oh, and hey, remember Judith? Um, yeah, she also uh, betrays Breen. Kind of like how she betrayed uh, Eli. You know, just karma, I guess. Gordon Alex to chase after Breen. Breen decides to make a deal with a Combine advisor to transform himself into a host body, and also agrees to teleport to the Combine Overworld, or basically their own planet slash place where the Combine have a little HQ and stuff. Gordon Alex, however, don't agree with Breen, and Gordon stops Breen from teleporting and successfully kills him. Oh, and he also blows up the entire fucking city though in the process, and also destroys like what, like half the city. Gordon however is stopped by the G-Man. The G-Man says that he's surprised by Gordon's work and decides to put him back temporarily into stasis. In the meantime, this is where I get off. Now I'm gonna be honest, I don't wanna be that guy, but Half-Life 2's graphics are kind of starting to show their age. Keyword, kind of. But despite this, the game's graphics look amazing for 2004. I mean, I can't believe this game came out before the 360 and PS3 round, since those are like the type of graphic I expect from a game on like the 360 or the PS3. But no, this game was made like an entire year before the 360 came out. The game's lightning is incredibly beautiful, and mixing the game's lightning with HDR makes the game even more beautiful. And if you add in the game's 2D skyboxes, it looks beautiful. Like, I swear to god, I don't know where they got the inspiration for the 2D skyboxes, like I think they might have like, drew them by hand or something, but they look beautiful, man. And after that combination of HDR, lightning, and 2D skyboxes, you get an amazing environment. 
and the lightning in the skyboxes really show you how much time has passed in game. Like for example, here it looks like it's 2pm in this map, but here in this other map it looks like it's 6pm. This game has beautiful lightning and on the topic of graphics, if you really want to make the game look modern, you could technically download like a metric shit ton of mods to improve it as you like. I mean all it really takes is like some mods from Bruh. Game Banana, maybe a little reshade, at the top it all off, cinematic mod, which is like honestly, like the most beautiful yet yeah, dog shit mod for a game that I've ever seen. It has beautiful graphics, but the creator of the mod has like added so much uh, interesting things of it that I think they don't deserve to be there. I don't think I don't think I need to explain what I'm talking about. Wow. I mean like, wow. Just like Half-Life 1, Half-Life 2 does not disappoint when it comes to the soundtrack. Honestly, Kelly Bailey, the game's composer, did a fantastic job of making the soundtrack. Although my problem with the game is that a lot of songs in the game end up being cut off when I transition to another level. So it's kind of lame to be honest, like, like I'd be vibing to the music, and then like 3 seconds after that it cuts off, and boom, it's gone. But hey, maybe I'm the problem. Maybe it's because I play the game way too fast. Kind of like, you know, speedrunning it, I mean, honestly, I've gotten so used to this game that I basically do like, b-hop every time. But I mean, hey, who knows? My favorite tracks from the game include Kaun, 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 Kion. Jesus Christ, what the hell was Kelly Bailey smoking when it came up with this damn song's name? LG Orbifold, CP Violation, Apprehension and Evasion, Triage of Dawn, Tracking Device, and lastly, Something Secret Steers Us. Like, honestly, this is a great soundtrack and it fits the game really, really well, to be honest. This soundtrack gets a straight 10 out of 10 for me. Now to the last part of this video, the game's legacy. Half-Life 2 and the Half-Life series in general have had a long-lasting legacy on both internet culture and video games. Thanks to Half-Life 2 and its amazing Source engine, which technically speaking the first Source engine game was Counter-Strike Source, but still it wasn't really that revolutionary, it was literally just Counter-Strike 1.6, both better textures and better graphics, same sound effects, same shit, just different graphics. We would not have gotten absolutely amazing games like Gary's mod, Team Fortress 2, Counter-Strike Global Offensive. Uh, hey guys, future me here, and believe it or not, my dumbass recorded this video right before CS2 was released. So, um, yeah, Gl Counter-Strike Global Offensive is nowadays known as CS2. It was ported over to the Source 2 engine, so, um, like, technically speaking, it's the same game, just with better graphics. Portal 1 and 2, and honestly, there are so many Valve and non-Valve games that use the Source engine that it would take me like a while to name all of these goddamn games. One of Half-Life 2's most important contributions to internet culture would have to be Gary's Mod. Ever since the mid to late 2000s, Gary's Mod has had an amazing grip on internet culture, thanks to game modes like Dark RP, Trouble in Terrorist Town, and the ever so famous Prop Hunt. Millions of gamers have basically been spending hours on this damn game, including me. Oh, and also Gmod spawned like several famous YouTubers and stuff like that and machinima makers. Honestly, I can't forget my man, the bullshit. BULLSHIT! And of course, we can't forget about good old Counter-Strike. I swear to god, the amount of Russian children and teenagers who have been influenced by this game is insane. And of course, we can't forget about SFM. Like, I swear to god, there are like a gajillion SFM videos out there on YouTube. A quarter of them are like FNAF, Source Filmmaker movies, another quarter is like TF2 related movies, and the rest is just a mix of random shit and stuff. But at the end of the day, you cannot deny the fact that Half-Life 2 still has a long lasting legacy. And of Half-Life Alex being released 3 years ago in 2020, and being made with Source 2, who knows what's next to come. In conclusion, Half-Life 2 is an absolutely timeless classic of a game. And I, along with like a couple million other people, will never stop playing this game and the other games in the series as well. And that's the end, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you enjoyed this video, then please consider liking the video. And hell, maybe even subscribe, maybe even share, do whatever the hell you want. Hell, maybe even comment, give me some like advice, because honestly, this is like the very first video that I do using my voice. But anyways, thanks for watching, and God knows when I'm going to see you all next time.